we're going to be discussing about small field dosimetry uh, today. So after this presentation, if you can distinguish why, why physics of small fields is different from physics of large fields, if you can explain to different nuances of small field measurements to other colleagues, and if you can recognize when you use different detectors in different situations and defend the importance of validation to your administrator, I will be satisfied. Okay. So what makes a field a small field? Uh, when at least, at least one of the, these conditions are fulfilled. There's a loss of lateral charge particle equilibrium or just a lateral equilibrium on the beam axis. There's a partial occlusion of the primary photon source by the collimating devices on the beam axis. Or if the size of the detector is similar or larger compared to the beam dimensions. We are gonna go over to through each one of these conditions, but we can call a field a small field if at least one of these conditions are fulfilled. So the first one, the loss of lateral charge particle equilibrium. This is a being related condition. As we know, the charge particle equilibrium is a fundamental principle of dosimetry and occurs when the dose equals the term of collision, the collision. In this graph, we can see in which distance from the edge of a field where the equilibrium occurs, depending on the beam energy. So for cobalt, for example, the range of particle, the lateral particle, uh, charge particle equilibrium occurs in about three, four millimeters for a four MV. Just one second, pointer. For a four MV, it occurs about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 millimeters. For a six MV, it occurs at about 1.1 centimeters. So this distance, this range of for the lateral equilibrium, it's proportional. I mean, it's it's related to the, the quality of the beam, as we can see here. So if you have a quality, a quality index of a beam, for example, TPR 2010 or PDD 10, we can model, we can know in which distance we are gonna reach the lateral equilibrium, right? Alicia, Hi. is it okay if I share the poll yes. about, okay, so if you'll permit me. So lateral charge particle equilibrium, I think is a concept that physicists are pretty familiar with. I know we're not all physicists. So just to make sure everyone knows kind of what we're talking about right now, when a six MB photon interacts with tissue, electrons are produced, which deposit doses as they scatter in different directions. We use uh, dosimeters you know, when we're doing QA to measure these electrons that are created. Uh, so what is meant when Alisa is talking about lateral charge particle equilibrium? Take a moment to try your best. Uh, the first option is lateral charge particle equilibrium is when electrons that scatter out of the radiated volume is equal to the electrons that scatter into the irradiated volume. Or lateral charge Particle equilibrium is a principle that a decimeter will always measure and that charge is zero at equilibrium due to conservation of charge. Or lateral charge particle equilibrium is a natural phenomenon that holds true for all field sizes of radiation. If it is not achieved for your SPRT or SRS treatment, then you're likely doing something incorrectly. We'll give maybe 15 more seconds, Alicia, if that's okay. okay. And please don't feel don't feel shy to answer. We have about 80 respondents so far. Okay, few more seconds. Okay, five, four. <laughs> I like Louis. I would have loved the don't know option. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> the next time we'll put that. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. So, Elisa, if you want to comment, you can see. Yeah, I think most of you answered it right. So the lateral equilibrium is when the electrons that get scatter out of the irradiated volume is equal to the electrons that scatter in the irradiated volume. So I'm, I'm still to explain this, but yes, yeah, most of you guys answered it right. So let me see why the second and third one is not right. 
is a principle that the dosimeter will always measure net. Yeah, no, this is completely out of question here. Natural phenomenon that holds true for all field sizes. It's not true for all field sizes, not for all regions of the field. We know that, for example, in the build-up region, we don't have the lateral, the, 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 the equilibrium of uh, charged particles. All right. <sighs> So, so to, to have the, the, the lateral equilibrium, we have to be away from the edge of the field by this range of lateral charged particle equilibrium here. And we know that it depends on the fields, on the, field, the, the beam energy. So going to the practical side. So for a given beam quality, cobalt 6, 10, 15 MV, the distance from the detector outer boundary to the field edge has to be bigger than this, this distance. So what's the, what's the conclusion here? That to achieve the, the, the lateral equilibrium, it depends on which field size we are talking about. And it depends, of course, of the size of your detector. Because if your detector is small enough to be a single point with no dimension, so the... Anything, any field size is smaller than two times this lateral range would be considered a small field size. If you have a detector that has a finite size, so if you sum the, the size of this detector plus two times the, the range of lateral uh, charge particle uh, equilibrium, we are going to have a definition of small field. Anything that's smaller than this will be considered a, a small field size. Another condition to call a beam a field, a small field, is the partial occlusion of the photon source. So if you assume that the photon source has a finite size, uh, represented here by a dimensional Gaussian, uh, for a non-small field size, photons coming from all parts of the source, the central part or the periphery, will be able to reach the measurement point, okay? If you start closing the collimator to the point that we start having our measuring, measuring point, not seeing all parts of the source, then we have a small field condition, right? So it's important to note that the primary photons coming from the periphery are blocked by the collimator system. So that means that for this measuring point, less photons, less photons from the, the source are reaching this point if you compare to larger field sites. Right? So this is a very important thing. In small, in very small field size, very small, the output factor drops quickly, not only because less quantum or collimator scattering scattering from the phantom or from collimator are reaching this point, but also because of the reduced number of photons that are reaching this point, the primary photons. Okay. So the central X will receive mainly photons coming from the central part of the source. These photons are more energetic than the peripheral ones. So the spectrum of photons or the fluence here will be different from the spectrum of larger field size, just because we have a, a harder beam, beams formed with the photons with more energy coming from the central part of the source. It's, it's very important to note as well that this primary source occlusion becomes relevant when the field size is comparable or smaller to the field size. Sorry, to the, the, to the size of the, the, the source, right? This primary source occlusion effect becomes more important when the field size is comparable or smaller than the size of the primary photon source. Okay. For modern Linux, the, pr the primary photon source is very, very small already. It's, uh, the magnitude of a few millimeters. So this effect of the occlusion of the source is only relevant when you're talking about very, very, very small field size, like the magnitude of millimeters. Okay. So this is to give you an example of how big is the, the, the focal spot size or, or the source of, of the, the source 
size of a lina. In this figure here, we can see the, the focal spot size for old Linux, Siemens, Viden, Viden, high energy. And each square here, it's a one by one millimeter. So even for old model Linux, the size of the source is about two, three millimeters, sometimes four. So to have a partial occlusion phenomenon for this type of source size, we need to be talking about a field size five mm or below. Right. And this, uh, this side here, we can see some source, source sizes for a true beam in, in different times. I mean, after one year, after two years, after three years, to see if there's any, any drift over time. And uh, we can see the field size are very, very small. Less than one, sorry, the source size is very small. The magnitude of one millimeter. So occlusion or partial occlusion of the photon source it's, it's very hard to, to obtain this because we are never go in, in field sizes of the magnitude of one or two millimeters. So usually before that, when the, we are talking about the, the loss of equilibrium, we are going to reach this, the loss of lateral equilibrium before we reach the partial occlusion of the source. The loss of lateral equilibrium <clears throat> can be explained as well in, in, in this way. Yeah? As the field size goes small, the field becomes an overlap of penumbras and the geometric field size and radiation field size given by the full width at half maximum don't match anymore. Huh? So if you're decreasing the field size, the, the final result is an overlap of penumbras and the full width at, at, the full width at half maximum that defines, usually for large field, defines the field size becomes different from the, the field size itself. So the full width of half maximum is greater than the geometric field size for small fields. And this, uh, they're recommended as a reference, mm -hmm. referencing the field size. We are gonna talk about this soon. And so this phenomenon that, I mean, the, the full width of half maximum being greater than the geometric field size. Let's say if you have a, a five by five polymeter or, or five mm cone for a stereotactic, the, the, the field size that we measure will be greater than 5 mm, right? So when you're, when you're planning an SRS case, you have to have this in mind so you can choose your, your cone properly. Akacho, can I have a question for you? Yes. Yeah. So we are talking now about the small field size. I want to know the definition of the big field size. So when, when we say this is not small, this is big and and this field size, we can reach the lateral equilibrium and the, you know, the, the, the rules of the small field size does not apply on this. Okay. Anything that's not a small field size is a big field size. <laughs> <laughs> as simple as that. So if, if I, I'm coming back, if we haven't reached the loss of large lateral equilibrium for a particular field size and the detector, because, you know, this is something that depends on the detector you're measuring and the energy of the beam. So you, you cannot say that a 3CM is a small field size. We need to say 3CM is a small field size if I'm, if I'm talking about a detector, that the combination of the detector size and the, the, the range of the, the lateral charge part, particle, the, the combination of them are, are small than the field size. So it depends also about the dosimetry tools that I'm, I'm, I'm judging this field size, if it is small or big. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, let's say we have a 6MV 3x3 three three field. Yeah. It's a small field size for a farmer chamber, but it may not be a small for a field size for diode, for example. So as long as I can measure it, it's not a small for for physics or you can okay, let's let, let's uh, let's study this image here that's it let's talk about the 6 mv that's the most common energy we have right so for the 6 mv mm -hmm. the range for for lateral equilibrium is 1.1 cm okay that means that if you have a, a, a dosimeter a detector that's Point quote has no dimension it's tens of millimeters a small field size is any anything smaller than 2.2 cm, mm -hmm. right? So if I have a, 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 a detector that's, uh, the, the, the dimension of, of this detector is like 
5 mm. So I, the minimum field size for a 6 mv beam that I can use this detector without considering this a small field is 2.2 plus 5 mm. So it's a 2.7 cm field size. Okay, I have a question from, mm. from Iraq. He said, uh, do we have a specific dimensions for field size? Maybe if this person can be more specific. No, yeah. there's no, no, I cannot say three, a field size of three CM is a small field size. I cannot say that. I need to specify the energy of the beam and the detector I'm talking about. Yeah, so it is, yeah. it is a combination of the dimension of the field size and the energy that I use and also the tool that I measure this yeah. equilibrium. Okay. Exactly. Okay. okay, thank you. Of course, there, there's, a, there, there's a, the, minimum field, the, the minimum field size considered to be a small field size. We know that it's two times the, the range. Right. If you are talking, if you if you if you assume that your detector is a point with no dimension, but there's no detector like this, right? So mm -hmm. we need to add the dimension of the detector to the minimum field size for each energy. Thank you. Okay. Another condition uh, for small field size, uh, as we were discussing, is the mismatch of the detector and the field size. Uh, if the, the if a detector, this is a detector related condition. Uh, the two first conditions were being related conditions. This is a purely the detector related condition. So if the radiation fluence across the detector volume is not constant, we, we know we have this type of conditions in small field dosimeter because the, the beam is not flat, right? This is a, the, uh, the signal of this is subject to a volume, volume averaging effect. The direct implication of that is that those for small fields, those in the central axis can be underestimated and the penumbra width can be overestimated. We will see how in the, the following slides. Okay. okay, let's say we want to measure a profile of one by one CM, okay? And we have a selection of the detectors of different dimensions to do so. Here we can see a comparison of the, the dimension in, in scale of each dimension of each detector to measure this one by one profile. Okay, so it's clear that a semi-flex chamber, which has this dimension, is not suitable to measure this profile, right? Because it has a, a, a bigger a big dimension compared to the field size. We can see here there are some other detectors that are more suitable because they have a, a very tiny dimension compared to the field size. So if you're measuring with a semi-flex, which is a, already a, sm a small chamber, right? It's not a super small chamber, but it's not a farm as well. But to measure a one by one CM field size, it might not be enough. Why? Because the effective point of measurement, let's say in the center of the, this profile, is gonna be measured by the chamber that has a, a dimension, right? So instead of accumulating the dose, in, on, only in this effective point of measurement, we are accumulating the dose in the di across the dimension, across the volume of the detector. So the borders will receive less dose, less fluence. So the signal read by this detector at this point won't be representing the, the effective point of measurement, it will be something lower than this, okay? So what you're gonna measure at the end is something that has underestimation of the dose at the point of measurement, okay? So this is because we are averaging the signal over or across the detector volume. If you're measuring another point, if you're measuring a point that's going towards the tail or the, the edge of the field, what's gonna happen here? So instead of measuring the, the point only in the effective point of measurement, I'm integrating this, the signal over the dimension of the detector, right? So what, uh, what I'm doing is this. So this part of the detector, we receive more dose than the, the, the dose that I'm trying to measure, right? At, at this point. But this part of the, the, the detector is receiving less dose than this point. But this part is not overcompensating compensating this. What I'm having here, it's a lack of signal, right? Because this, this lack 
is more than this excess, right? So I have a lack of a lack of signal, and I'm underestimating the dose measured here. On the other hand, if I measure something in this point here, more towards the tail of the profile, instead of integrating the dose at the at the effective point of measurement, what I'm doing is averaging the dose over or across the volume of the detector. So in this case, I'm measuring more dose in this side that's not being compensated by the lack of the dose in this side. So that means that the dose at this point is overestimated a little bit, okay? So the result of the combination of all these three things is that I have, a, I have less dose in the central X. I have a little bit less dose off X, but I have more dose out of the field, okay? So the combination of this is, of course, depending on the, the, the volume of the detector. The bigger, the bigger the detector, the bigger the volume averaging effect, right? See, we can see a micro silicon is a very, very tiny detector gives you the, the, almost the true profile. The micro diamond, micro diamond is the same, but the, the pinpoint and the same flex, they have a, a fi finite dimension that will promote, that will provoke some volume averaging effects and will alter your, your profile somehow. So usually, the, what, what's the worst implication of this? First, we are under do, underestimating the dose in the central X and we are broadening, broadening the penumbra, right? But usually when you do, when you do profile measurements, we normalize this profile to the central X. If I normalize something that's under, underestimated, I'm gonna push everything, every, all the points of the, this curve up, right? So what's gonna happen there? I have, I normalize the, 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 the central X, okay, but you cause a deformation in the penumbra and that those outside of the field will be superestimated. Okay. This is another way of think, of, of seeing this. So the, the, the red line is the true profile, right? And the blue line is the profile measured with a detector that had some dimension. It's not matching properly the field size. So once I normalize it, I will bring this point to match this one. And I will have an overestimation of those out of field and the, I will be broadening the field size that I measure, right? So this is very important. Have, have this in mind when you're doing your measurements. Choosing the right, the, 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 the right detector for your profile is crucial, right? The volume of averaging effect also is present in the PDD. So for a small field size, can be careful, uh, be careful on the size of your ion chamber or your detector. Because when you do a when you do a PDD from bottom to top, something wrong, we we create this that our PDD, right? So because of the of the diver, divergence of the, the beam in the bottom part of the tank or of your fan, there might not be any volume averaging effect, right? Because the field here is, diver is big enough. But when you go towards the surface, the, 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 the field size there is smaller. So we may have some volume effect here that will reduce the signal of the chamber of your detector. And you're gonna be measuring something lower than the true PDD, okay? Again, PDD is something that you always normalize to the DMAX, right? If you do so, we can uh, have a good agreement of the, the true PDD and, and the measurement here, but are you overestimate the, the, the rest of, the, of my PDD? So be aware of the volume averaging effect in PDDs as well, okay? So if you're talking about output factors, and if you're not correcting our measurements, if you're not correcting our measurements for, for this volume averaging, we can have some very known effects. This is something that we know for, for a long time, right? That as I go down in field size and I'm using detectors that are big, I have a volume averaging effect. So I, I'll be reading less signal, 
So my output vector will be lower. If I have a decent uh, proper vector size, I will be reading the, 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 the output vector as it should be. I'm not talking about the, the properties, uh, the dosimetric properties of this, it's just the averaging effect. So if I'm not correcting for any averaging effect, I can underestimate my output factors when using detectors that are not suitable for that field size. And this has, may have a very import, important impact in your, your dose calculation. You can overdose patients when you treat this, this field size. Okay, so we talked about the definition of field size and the implications of, of volume averaging effect. So if you are familiar with the TRS-398, the, the, the formal is for, for those reference measurements, you know that the determination at reference conditions has to be done in a 10 by 10 field size, right? So how to determine the absorbed dose with a calibrated detector from a primary calibration laboratory that uh, this is the ones that we have in our clinic for a machine that does not allow a 10 by 10 field size. Uh, this is one, one, one of the things that this new S483 protocol gives us, how to measure the reference dose for machines that don't allow you to have a 10 by 10 field size. We know some machines like CyberKnife, Gamma Knife, Tomotherapy, or some machines that have a micro B don't allow us to, to, to do a 10 by 10 field size. So in this case, how to determine the, the reference do dose to give you the, the machine output of your, of your machine? I have a question from Islam okay. before to okay. go through this topic. Islam said, since we prescribe to a marginal dose and not to the isocenter, why we should care about the field size? Because you, because you, you, you model your TPS based on, on what you measure. If you don't measure it properly, you won't model it properly. So what you're seeing your TPS is not what you're delivering. But that's the importance of measuring the dose, not only in this properly, not only the central X, but also in the profiles. Okay. Okay, so we, small field dosimetry, I mean, we need to talk about, you know, absolute dose determination and also in relative dosimetry, right? The TRS-483 gives you, actually, there are, two, there, there, there are two independent codes of practice in this document. One for reference dosimetry, when you have a machine that doesn't give you a 10 by 10 field size or doesn't allow you to, to do uh, SS, SST 100, for example. And the other part of the, the, the code of practice, the TRS, is related to small field dosimetry. How to determine uh, output factors, how to measure profiles and PDDs for small, field, small fields. Okay, we are gonna talk about that quickly about the reference dosimetry because it's, it's part of the, the TRS 483 protocol. And we are gonna talk more about the the relative dosimetry for small fields, okay? So the TRS-483 introduces the concept of machine-specific reference field. So for example, tomotherapy doesn't give you a 10 by 10 field size at 100 SSD. It gives you a, it gives you a five by 10 and SSD 85, right? CyberKnife doesn't give you a 10 by 10 field size. The, mag, the, the biggest circular collimator is a 6 cm. And the, the, the reference SSD for it is 80 cm, right? A gamma knife doesn't give you a 10 by 10 field size. The max field size, depending on the model, it's 1.6 or 1.8 cm cone, right? And never gives you a 100 SSD. The, the biggest SSD, I mean, the reference SSD for this machine is at 32 cm, far away from the 100 cm. So the, the TRS-398 doesn't apply directly to this to this type of machines. It's important to note that the machine specific reference is not a small field. Okay, so I cannot determine the absorbed dose properly in a small field. I can I can measure the relative dose to the to the reference field, which is not a small field. Right? So we are going to talk quickly about this now. So, so if it's not a small field, if the reference of the machine is not a small field, that means that there's, there's lateral charge apart to equilibrium and there's no source occlusion. Okay, this is very important. And 
you are measuring your 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 dose to measure the dose for reference for a reference field we need to use ionization chamber this is diode or solid state and dosimeter is not appropriate for this and uh, we also have a part of the the the, the, the TRS 483 which is uh, related to to reference dosimetry only right we are not measuring dose properly we are measuring a relative dose so it's it's useful for those machines that don't that don't satisfy the reference conditions. We know that. Sorry, I think this is it's still about this is reference to symmetry. This is still about the, the, the machine specific reference. So it's useful for machines that don't satisfy reference conditions, like uh, doesn't give you a ten by ten field size or not doesn't uh, allow you to set up your phone to at 880 or 100 uh, SSD. More specifically for machines like tomotherapy, cyber knife, gamma, gamma knife, or machines that have cone or micro MLCs. Okay. It introduced a new concept, the machine-specific reference field, MSR. The, 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 the field size of this MSR is the max field size allowed by, by the machine, close to the 10 by 10 field size. If it gives a 10 by 10 field size, you don't need a MSR. Okay. The field, the, the, the field of reference is not as small, so you need a lateral equilibrium. There's no source occlusion. And that you the field allows you to use the detector that satisfies this, this equation. Okay. So this protocol is very similar to the TRS-398 to determine the dose, the dose, but introduced a new being called correction factor, which is this correction factor that brings you from, if you have your, your calibration factor for the machine from the, 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 lab, the, from the primary laboratory, uh, for the reference laboratory, usually it's in cobalt for a 10 by 10 field size and bring you to the quality of the field that you are measuring because this, this, Machine doesn't give you the same quality of what we have in your, your calibration, your certif certificate. And to the field size that the machine is able to give you. Right? Also, there's a, a part of this, this protocol that touches the small field dosimeter for relative dosimeter, like output factor. Okay. So the determination of, the, of dosing water for, for specific machines, for this special machines, basically is given by your detect, detector reading multiplied by the calibration coefficient for, for, of, of your chamber times this new factor that is introduced now, it's called beam quality correction factor. And there's a table for each machine, right? So this, this correction factor is the beam quality correction factor that corrects for the use of the calibration coefficient in the field FMSR, the field of the machine specific uh, reference, and the beam quality in the, de in the detector specifically. So let's uh, let's see. So this 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 factor corrects for the density of the sensitive volume of the detector, the atomic properties of the sensitive volume, the presence of extra camera components, and also for volume averaging, because this is intended also, I mean, most of these fields are, are unflattened beams, right? Tomotherapy, cyber knife, gamma knife, they're all unflattened beams. But this is to give you an idea about the volume averaging, because the, this correction factor corrects for the, the volume averaging especially for a specific type of machines. If you have an ion chamber for uh, different sizes and uh, I'm measuring beams that are unflatted for different machines, I see that most of the, the, the machines, even if they're from different vendors, they have more or less the same dirt, the same properties, as long as they are with the same energy. So the, the correction factors for averaging are the same, more or less the same for depending on the the energy. So I can say that the averaging, the volume averaging factor is related more to the energy that, than to the vendor. And of course, it depends on the, the length of your, your ionization chamber. The bigger the ionization chamber, the bigger is the correction factor that you need to use. I mean, the bigger, I mean, far away from one, from the unit, right? 
So the worst case here, the outlier is the cyber knife. The cyber knife has a unflattened beam as well, but it's more, it's sharper than the the uh, the other machines, the tomotherapy or electro through being um, FFF beams or or artists. Yeah. Carlos, we had a we had a question from Nedal Ibrahim, and okay. it's all, it's also my question. Mm-hmm. She's she or he, I'm sorry. We do warm up and the QA every morning using a quick check for Linux output, and with 10 by 10 centimeter. Mm-hmm. Uh, is it considered to be efficient QA for SRS and SPRT? My question was in the stereo taxi on Linux base. Do we have to do our QA on 10 by 10 field size w- w- without going to the rules? Because yes. we have already a big size field. Yes. Uh, for, da- for daily QA, you're just comparing your, your being at that day to a benchmark. So you're not measuring effectively the dose, the absorbed dose, right, in that point. So you're just uh, doing a, a benchmark. So it shouldn't be a problem. And... And and not daily, let's say the QA for the patient is for the case, particular case in a stereo taxi Linux based, not mm-hmm. not specific machines. Not I don't have Tomo, I don't have Cyper. I just mm-hmm. have my stereo or SRS SPRT on Linux based. So do I have to do my QA on 10 by 10 field size and refer that to the small field sizes, or what should we do? I say patient-specific QA is something that we're going to touch later, but think about this. Are you using for a, a patient treatment always the same field size? I mean, all the beans that you're, you're using to treat, it's always the same cone or the same MLC opening. If it's MLC opening, of course not, because each bean has a different dimension. But for a cone, maybe yes, you're treating all the beans with the same... But if you're not treating with the same bean field size, you're going to see that the uh, correction factors uh, are depending on the, the field size. So if you have a, a, a plant that has many beans and each one with a different field size, it's, it's very hard to apply one correction factor for each bean. Right? So, and we will see that the correction factors are, are very tiny, usually, no more than 1%, 2%. So for patient-specific QA, since we don't know, or it's very hard to the field size for each being you're treating and correct each being individually, it's 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 important. I mean, we just ignore these factors and accept a, a, a bigger variation in your results. The tolerance it's it's a little bit more bigger, and you have the uncertainty bigger as well. Yeah. But still, still, it's, it's uh, acceptable. Okay, we have. I don't another know if I answer your question. Yeah. yeah, we have another question from Shakir Osman from Iraq. We must have a, f- a different phantom for QA, or we can use the same IMRTB mat phantom. He's asking about the phantom. So I'm talking about now about only relative dosimetry that preference pre- preferably should be done in water, right? And also relative dosimetry. Profiles, PDDs, and output factors, which also must be done in water, right? So for patient-specific QA, or for daily QA, or for monthly QA, for benchmarking or machine, maybe you can use some sol- uh, solid water phantoms or other phantoms, but this is, I think, out of the scope of this presentation. Did I answer your question? Hello? Yeah, I think so. It's, it's Ibrahim question. Mm-hmm. Okay, talking about uh, now some averaging factor, correction factors for uh, different chambers, depending on the on the on the on the machine, the, the on the the, the beam quality. Of course, we, we we talked about this, right? The the averaging factor depends on the, the, the size of the the detector and also the the, the quality of the beam. Uh, so so we define the quality of the beam by the TPR twenty ten for at, for a ten by ten field size. But we just talk about something, you know, uh, machines that don't, don't allow you 10 by 10 field size. So how come I can have a, a TPR 2010 for a 10 by 10 field size for machines that don't allow you a 10 by 10 field size? So there's a formula, actually, to convert. You can measure TPR 2010, for, for example, for your, if you have a cyber knife that gives you the max field size of a cone of a system. So you measure the TPS, the TPR 2010 at 6 of your cone of 6 cm. 
And uh, through this formula here, you can convert to a, a hypothetical TPR 2010 of a 10 by 10 field if, if it was possible to, to have a TPR 2010 of a 10 by 10 for a cyber knife, for example. The same thing you can do for PDD if you define the quality of your being by PDD. Those are correction factors, the beam quality correction factors for gamma knife. So depending on, the, the, on your chamber. So if I have a gamma knife and the, the max uh, field size, the MSR for my, my, my gamma knife is 18 mm, I'm allowed to use some chambers, right? And depending on the, the phantom that I'm using, solid water or, or, or water or ABS, I will apply these factors to the, the same formalism that I have for the TRS-398. It's as simple as that, right? Now, if I'm measuring field outputs, so relative dosimetry, so the TRS-483 introduces this field output correction factor. Okay, It's a correction factor. It, it corrects the conventional rate of the detector readings for perturbations that depends on the field size, okay? So basically, if I want to measure an output factor for a small field, which is a ratio between two field, the, measurement, uh, the measurement of two field sizes, right? Your, your machine-specific field to your clinical field, let's say 1 cm, 2 cm, you, you need to apply this correction factor. This, this is the field output correction factor. Okay, so don't mistake this for by the, the, the previous uh, correction factor. That's specifically for reference dosimetry. If you're measuring the absorbed dose of your machine, okay, this is for output only. Okay, when you're measuring your output for small field size, the previous factor is not for small field size. It's for the reference field size that your machine allows. This factor is called field output factor. It's specifically for output factors when you have a small field. Okay. So basically your output factor will be the reading, the rate of the readings of your detector based on, on the field, different field size reference by the clinical one multiplied by the field output correction factor that is given for each machine field size and detector in tables. Let's see an example of this table. So let's say I have a, a machine that's in the field size is defined by the MLC or SS cone for a machine that's a 6MV with or without flattening filter. Okay, so this is a C-arm Linux that we are used to, right? If you're measuring the, the output factors for a small field size, for each field size, depending on the chamber or state, a solid state, a solid state that I'm using, I will have correction factor. Let's say, for example, that I have a machine, a Trilogy or a Versa HD, 6MV, with or without FFF, it doesn't matter, they have the same factor. And I want to measure output factors from, let's say, 10CM or 8CM all the way to 1CM, okay? <laughs> I'm going to take for each field size the, the, the specific, and I'm using, let's say, a PTW semiflex. For eight, eight by eight field size, there's no correction. The correction is one. So I can use what I'm, I'm I used to do right now for big field size. So the reading, the, the ratio of the readings for eight and 10 by 10. For the six is the same. For the four by four is the same for this chamber. Now, if if I go down to three by three, I have to apply this 0.1% correction if I'm using this chamber. For two and a half by two and a half, it's 0.2% and, and it increases. When I, when I go lower than 1.5 by 1.5, there's no values. That means that the correction factor is bigger than 5%. Here's 2.5%. If I if I could go down to 1.2 by 1.2, there's no value for that. What's the reason there's no value for this? It's because the factor is more than 5%. And if it's more than 5%, the, the protocol does, doesn't allow you to, to do any correction. You should, that means that you shouldn't be used 
be using the same effects to measuring a field size that's smaller than 1.2 by 1.2. If I want to, to measure something smaller than this, output is smaller than this, I should pick one chamber or one dosimeter or one other detector that allows me to go as slow as I want. In this case here, the, the most appropriate chamber would be the BACC01. I could go up to 0.6 by 0.6 cm. Okay, this is for chambers. Huh? If you see here, all the numbers, all the numbers, usually they go up as the, the field size decreases for ion chambers. If you see the detector, the, the uh, solid state detectors, we have chambers as well. And usually we can measure a smaller field size because their, their dimensions are smaller. And what happens here, I start with big or, or, or higher correction factors for big field size. And uh, as I go down, it drops, it drops. So the correction factors, for output, uh, they are different. The, the, their behavior is different if you look at the ion chambers or if you look at uh, solid state. This is because the, uh, of the density of the, the, the detectors. Uh, solid states they have higher density compared to the water, while ion chamber is filled with water, uh, with air, and air has less density than uh, water. So I have the tables also for cyber knife. And I have tables also for, this is a gamma knife. Okay. So gamma knife, I don't have as many field size, limited field size. And this is the, 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 the table of the behavior of the, of the correct correction factors. As I go down in size, for ion chambers, the correction factors go up. Regardless, the, I mean, the, 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 the type of the, of the chamber. For... Solid state and other types of detectors, the behavior is they usually the detectors go down as I decrease the field size. Okay. So when you are doing the dosimetry measurements, what type of detector should I use? So there's there's no ideal detectors. We know that. I mean, each detector has a correction factor to be applied. Okay. So be aware of the pros and cons of each detector. This is very important to understand the behavior of your, your, your detector when you're doing any type of measurement. Understand them, consult the documentation of this detector, talk to the, the vendors, and go online and check your papers regarding your, your detector and see when they are suitable to be used. So as this is a new thing for us, and we, we are not super familiar with the, the all type of detectors, it's always good to use two or three different type of detectors when, measure, when doing any type of, of, of measurement and apply the factors and see if they converge in the final result. They should converge within 1%, right? It's good, for example, if you're measuring your output, if you have a, a small ionization chamber that you know that the, uh, the correction factors for output goes up, as the, the, the collimator goes down. To have to compare this with a solid state to, that we know that the, the correction factors go down as, as the, the detectors, as the field size goes down. So after we apply the corrections, they sh the final result should match, right? You can use also ionization chambers. I mean, as I told you, you can check against the radiochromic film or unshielded diode, for example. Or you can use dia leaked ion chamber and organic scintillator, for example. You, you, you do a mix of, of detectors with different properties, different correction factors, but the final results should be should agree, right? Uh, as I said, we, we are not allowed to choose any detector that don't have correction factors bigger than 5%, right? Ideally, 2%. Uh, be aware of a detection orientation. We're going to talk about this and centering of the detector when you're doing your, your, your measurement, especially for output. Okay. So for output, of output measurements, if you're doing output measurements of small field size, make sure that the JAWS and the MLC are calibrated 
because a small difference in the calibration of the jaws of the, of the MLC may affect your output dramatically. You are going to see an example of this later. Your reference chamber, as we are doing output measurements, it's always good to have a, a, a reference chamber because any any oscillation uh, oscillation in, in uh, those weights may, may, may cause any problems, right? If you're doing, it's, it's, this is especially for, for scans, it's scans, right? Uh, PDDs and uh, profiles. Right, so you can use so the reference chamber cannot be, I mean, can cannot be interfering in in your field chamber. Neither your cham field chamber can be interfering in your in your in your reference chamber. Right, options for this is that transmission chambers that, that they are transparent to the beam. I mean, it affects a little bit the beam, but in a homogeneous way, so the the chamber won't the field chamber won't be affected by it. Or you can introduce your reference chamber in a specific slot in the LINAC head. And this way, there's no interference of the reference chamber in the, the, in the field chamber. Some scanning parameters when you are doing PDDs and the profiles. Choose the adequate speed to avoid water surface perturbation. Right? If, there's a, if the, the surface is shaking a little bit, you may have some ripple effects. Ripple effects. Submillimeter steps. Since we are measuring small field size, it's important to, to go to have a very special good special resolution, usually 0.2 mm for field size smaller than 15 mm. So we have a, a, a good sampling of points. And 0.5 mm for field size bigger than sorry, this is should be 15 mm. Also, the sampling time has to be long enough to avoid noise readings. This is very important as well. But it doesn't need to be too long, so your readings take too long to, to your scans take too long to, to be measured. So it's very important to, to center very well your detector, especially output factors. I mean, in any case, it's very important to, to center your detector, right? The light field, just for initial alignment, never trust, trust your light field for centering the detector, especially for small field size. Right? So the way I implant cross-plane scanning to find the central X at all measurement steps. Check different depths if, measurement, if measuring PDDs. So you ensure that the scanning is parallel to the central X. We are going to talk about this later. Scan your central X every depth, every time a profile is done, no matter how good your setup is. So always check and recheck centering, center and recenter if necessary. For MLC-shaped fields, perform alignment procedure at a full width at half maximum. Determination every time you change the, the, the field size. It's very important for hysteresis effect. So this is just to show you how important is either centering your detector to the center of the field or having a MLC or jaw calibrated. Because if there's a if you introduce a field size error of one millimeter, or if you introduce a detector position error of one millimeter, as you go down in field size after maybe 15 mm or 1.5 cm field size, you start having some issues, especially for field size in terms of output factor. So make sure that you have your, your machine very well um, calibrated before start any measure. The detector orientation is very important as well. This may be trivial, but uh, it's important to note. To note. So if, if you have an ionization uh, ion chamber, you can scan the beam uh, with the chamber oriented and below to the beam, so to the, to the beam way, or you can scan it uh, in a perpendicular way. As long as you don't do this, go with the, the cable, with the, the, the steam of the chamber, in and out of the beam, right? So this one here, this orientation is not allowed. So for solid state detectors, you can scan, you should scan with the with the detector parallel to the beam, and you never you never do perpendicular to the beam, right? And this is not allowed, neither, neither this, this one. The TRS-483 gives you some uh, orientations uh, regarding the the, the orientation of the detector for any type of... Uh, when measuring PDDs for small fields, small and small, very small fields have minimum in scattering photons. I mean, it's mainly primary, right? The, the scattering from, from the header from the front is minimal. 
So the beam spectrum is the same all the way in the depth. So we can use either shielded or unshielded diodes, no matter what. I mean, because there's no interference of low energy scattered radiation. So usually when you're doing PDD, the recommended detectors are unshielded diodes, micro diamonds or shielded diodes. Also small, small volume fields, uh, your ionization chambers. So this is to show you for small field size, 4 mm, 7.5, 10, 15 mm, regardless the, 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 the detector, as long as there's no averaging effect, as long as you have a small detector, you should, give, you should have the same results, right? Very important uh, to have your chamber centered on the radiation all, at all depths. This means your radiation being is perpendicular to the phantom and your mechanics of the scanning system are parallel to the beam. This is very important for small field size in special, because we know that for big field size, if you are measuring the PDD, in the central X, in normal conditions, it's fine. But if there's if the gain is a little bit tilted or if the, me the mechanics is not aligned to the central X of the beam, you still have a good match between your measurements. But for small field size, because the the... the the, the, the fluence varies over the, the field size. If you measure in the proper way, but if you have a small tilt of, of, the, of the gain or, or of the mechanism, you can be measuring the lower fluence region and you're going to be having a lower signal for the PDD. For small field size in general, the lower the better. That means that for small field size, the PDD increases with the, detector, with the detector volume because of the volume averaging effects. So if you have two different detectors and you, you, you're sure that there's no alignment or centering issues, the one that gives you the, the lower PDD at the depth, it's the best one. For known to a small field size, like a four by four, volume averaging effects are negligible for most of the detectors and the energies. And the energy dependence of the detectors due to the low energy scattering irradiation is minimal. Again, this is a, a small field size, so there's very little scattering of a low energy radiation. So most of the detectors should give you a good response or should, should give you similar results. Regarding patient specific QA, I, I saw there were some, some questions. There will be a session specific for this, will be a section 16. I, 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 won't, I, I think I will skip this slide since we are going to have a, a specific session just for that, since we already are ahead of the time. And I'd like to conclude that for a small field size, the let, let, lateral charge particle equilibrium a source occlusion and size of the detector versus size of the field size should be considered. That's what, what defines a small field size. We talked about the TRS-483. Actually, there are two codes of practice there. One for reference dose that introduce the machine-specific field versus detector size corrections. And also another aspect of this TRS is the field output corrections when you're measuring outputs for a small field size. When you're doing small field measurements, uh, Having in mind the choice of detectors, depending on the type of measurements and the field size, centering, beam alignment, and scanning parameters are crucial. Be very careful with that. Be aware of volume averaging, depend, depending on the measurement and on, on the, the, dio, the detector you're using. And since this is very new for all of us, uh, always compare the same type of measurement with different. There are some references for this lecture if you want to go more in depth on that. The TRS, PTW in, in its website has a very nice uh, summary of the small field dosimetry and how to choose the proper dosimeter for each type of measurement. Of course, they're talking about their, their own dosimeters that, that doesn't mention any dosimeter from the competition, but it's a good guide. Also, the summary of the of the TRS uh, three four eight three.